Nika along with Emu is one of the most mysterious characters in the world of One Piece. So far we have only heard legends about this character. But what if the legend of Nika is different from what other characters have passed down to us? What if Nika was actually a slave and not a warrior of liberation? In this video we will take a closer look at this theory. Let's start with the legend of Sun God Nika. We first hear about this name from Who's Who in his fight with the Jinbei. Who's Who himself was once a prisoner of the world government and there he heard that slaves worship a certain sun god named Nika. This sun god is said to have made slaves laugh and freed them from their worries. Who's Who also believes in this legend of sun god Nika, he needed hope in his situation. Although it is not confirmed yet, it is very likely that Who's Who was held captive on Marijua and Fred during Fisher Tiger's rampage. Interestingly, Husu questioned Jinbei about the Sun Pirates. This could be an indication of this assumption. He wanted to know if the Sun Pirates had a connection to this legend, but Jinbei did not elaborate on it. So it is very likely that Husu was not wrong with this assumption. Tiger fred as many slaves as possible in Marijua, he did not differentiate between the races. In the Sun Pirates, everyone bears a symbol of a sun on their body. In some cases, the hooves of the dragon, the symbol of the Tenryubito, was replaced with a sun. The sun is very likely seen as a metaphor for Nika, it was not Nika who came to Marijua to free the slaves, but Fisher Taiga. Taiga inherited the will of Nika, he did what was spoken of in the legend. Besides Taiga, there are two other confirmed characters who have been inspired by Nika, one of them knows the legend of this legendary figure, but the other does not. The first one is Kuma. His flashback starts with chapter 1095. We learn that Kuma also heard of the legend of Nika from his father. Both of them were slaves of the Tenryubito at that time. The legend of Nika was passed on to the Buccaneer tribe. This is a tribe to which Kuma and his father belong. This tribe is nearly extinct. Now it is finally clear which three races Big One was missing in Totolan. The Giants, the Lunarians and the Buccaneers. They carry the blood of the Giants within them. Kuma and his father started dancing like Nika to spread joy. His father was then shot shortly after because he was too loud. This cruel act shaped Kuma's life. He also passed on Nika's dance to his daughter Bonnie. In a memory with Bonnie, Kuma also talks about his dream. He wants to relieve people of their suffering and give them freedom, just like Nika. Besides Saiga, Kuma was the next who inherited the will of Nika. Only Monkey D. Luffy is now missing. Our protagonist has indirectly inherited the will of Nika, but in a slightly different way. Luffy travels from island to island and then befriends the characters on the island. When someone needs help, Luffy helps them. He doesn't always actively pursue the goal of giving others their freedom, but through his actions, this is almost always the case in every arc. Luffy spreads freedom and joy without even knowing about Nika and his legend. In the further course of the story, Luffy will actually learn about Nika because his devil fruit seems to be the same one that Nika once had. But more on that later. There is another tribe in One Piece that speaks of a sun god, namely the Shandians in the flashback of Nolan. They also worship a sun god. Nika is not explicitly mentioned here. But in the Skypiea arc, there's a party panel where Luffy dances as a silhouette just like Nika. By the way, that's Oda's favorite panel in the manga. For a long time, it was not known why exactly this panel, but since Who's Who talked about Sun God Nika, it should be clear. The sun plays a crucial role in One Piece. Many characters are waiting for the dawn. The fishmen have their path through the sun, the giants celebrate a winter solstice, and Vano is the land of the rising sun. All these tribes have a connection to the sun god Nika or to Joy Boy. Because when we talk about Nika, we are indirectly always talking about Joy Boy. This name first appears on the poneglyph on Fishman Island. This poneglyph is an apology letter from Joy Boy to the princess of the island at that time. Joy Boy had promised to bring them to the surface. Unfortunately, Joy Joy Boy was not able to fulfill his promise. As we discover in Odin's flashback, Joy Boy hid a treasure on Laugh Tale. After finding the treasure, Roger wished that he had lived in the same era as Joy Boy. Roger and his crew simply laughed when they found the treasure. In addition to the fishmen, the residents of Vano and the Lunarians were also waiting for Joy Boy's return. According to Odin, the borders of Vano must be opened when Joy Boy returns. The Lunarians, on the other hand, were aware of the prophecy. For example, King believed that Kaido was the reincarnation of Joy Boy. Kaido was more like a fake Joy Boy. Although Kaido made his allies and people laugh, it was a forced laughter due to the effects of the smile fruits. They had to laugh even if they didn't feel like it. Furthermore, instead of spreading freedom and joy, Kaido spread hate, oppression, war and slavery. These are the complete opposite of the values that Joy Boy represents. It is very likely that the Lunarians were allied with Joy Boy during the White Century. Currently, we know a confirmed living witness who was a Nakama with the OG Joy Boy. It is the giant elephant Zunisha. After hearing the drums of liberation, Zunisha recognized the return of Joy Boy. Besides Zunisha, Imo and the Gorosei probably know more about the OG Joy Boy. The interesting thing here is that both the legend of Nika and the legend of 
of Joyboy are connected with the drums of Liberation. It is very likely that Nika and Joyboy were one and the same person. However, why are there two legends? Why is there a legend surrounding the sun god Nika and another legend surrounding Joyboy? Wouldn't just one legend about this character be enough? This is an interesting question that we can explore further. Because now Joyboy aka Nika has returned. But before that I want to briefly explain why I believe that Joyboy and Nika are the same person. Nika is most likely the character's name and Joyboy is something like a title or nickname. Joyboy is something one can become. Kaido wanted to become Joyboy, but he didn't. Instead it was Luffy. When Luffy triggered the awakening of his devil fruit, Zunisha talks about the return of Joyboy. However at Marijo or the Gorosei talk about the return of Nika. Zunisha and the Gorosei are discussing the same scenery, but they have different names for it. I have a feeling that at some point in his life Nika became Joyboy. His Nakama and former allies call him Joyboy, while his enemies and the slaves call him Nika. The residents of Fishman Islands, the residents of Vano, the Lunarians and even Zunisha were all allies of Joyboy back then. Imu and the Gorosei on the other hand were his enemies. They seem to have known the OG Joyboy. After all, there's a theory that Imu and the Gorosei have been alive since the Void Century. Through Luffy's Devil Fruit Awakening and the sound of the Drums of Liberation, Joyboy has returned. The Gum Gum Fruit is also called the Hito Hito no Mi Mythical Model Nika. This means that the abilities that Nika had in the Void Century were later named after him. But who was Nika actually? Nika probably experienced adventures similar to Luffy and Roger. Freedom, joy, dancing, laughter, passing down dreams and the death that arise from being forgotten are all motives that I believe Nika lived by. Nika's dream and will trigger the story of One Piece. Although Nika is dead, his will lives on in the characters who knew him or heard about his legend. His will is immortalized under the name of Joyboy and the Poneglyphs. However, unlike Luffy and Roger, Nika lost in the past. He died. The current Void Century is probably the time when Nika and his allies fought against Emu and the 20 royal families that later became the world government. In the end, Nika lost and the world government was established. The winner becomes the new justice. The Tenryubito system was established and it still exists today. Nika was probably the opponent of Emu in the Void Century. The lives of the two creates a significant contrast. While Nika's physical body died, his values, his dreams and his ideals continue to live on even 800 years after his death. His will was taken up by the legends created by other characters. Like it says in One Piece, only one dies when they are forgotten. Emu on the other hand fears death. Emu did not pass down his dreams and will, unlike Nika is not willing to share his dream, his physical body has probably been living for more than 800 years. I also believe that Nika founded the will of the D. He was most likely the ruler of the ancient kingdom known for spreading joy and freedom. Anyone could become a member of this kingdom. Everyone in this kingdom had a D in their name. The symbol for joy and freedom, a smiling mouth. We now know that the Nefeltari family also belongs to the D carriers. The D was mentioned in a letter from Lily. The D carriers are associated with a smile. When they die, their lips change into a smiling mouth. We have seen this with Roger and Ace. But Rocinante and Odin also died with a smiling mouth. This suggests that anyone can become a D carrier if they want to. They just have to be willing to spread joy and freedom. The D carriers are also in stark contrast to the Tenryubitu. The Tenryubitu are an elitist 800 year old club where you can only join based on your bloodline. Only 19 royal families and their descendants became Tenryubitu. In contrast, the D carriers accept anyone as long as the person is willing to laugh and be free. The reason why anyone can become a D carrier is supported by Zabo's memory with Ace and Luffy. He asks them why they carry a D in their name. Ace then says that he can have one too. He would then be Za Di Bo. This was obviously a joke from Ace, but there's probably more to it. Because the Nefeltari family also became D carriers, although they belong to one of the 20 royal families that founded the world government. That means they probably didn't have the D before. I believe otherwise the other kingdoms would not have allied with them. The D carriers are after all enemies of the gods aka the Tenryubitu. However, there may have also been a traitor among the D carriers. Oda likes to use such plot lines in One Piece. The story of Nika and the legend of the sun god also reminds me of Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust. During his time in the concentration camps, he developed logotherapy. This form of psychology deals with the question of finding meaning in one's life and the power of motivation that a person has. Frankl tried to find meaning in what he was doing during his time in the concentration camp. Everything was taken away from him. 
The only thing he had left was his mind and his imagination. He managed to project himself into situations that gave him strength during this cruel experience. He imagined giving lectures where he would talk about his time as a holocaust survivor, seeking meaning in situations that are so cruel that there seems nothing positive left. Reminded me strongly of the slaves who have to work for the Tenryubitu. If they are too loud, they are simply shot. Through the legend of Nika, the slaves have a glimmer of hope. The dancing and the drums of liberation gave them hope that someone will eventually save them. This someone will also appear at Marijoa in the final saga of One Piece. But how did Nika become Joy Boy, the warrior of liberation and the sun god? I believe that Nika was once a slave, either at the beginning or the end of a story. In One Piece there's a motive that flashback characters have to take the blame for something they are not responsible for. Noland is called a liar even though his stories are true. The golden city really exists, but it was catapulted into the sky by a knock-up stream. Tom takes the blame for the destruction of Water 7 with the Battle Frankies, in reality it was Pan Dam. King Riku under the control of the Flamingo attacks his own people and is subsequently dethroned. I believe that Nika too was burdened with something he didn't do during the course of the story. Rosinante mentioned in the flashback with Law that the D-Carriers are the natural enemies of the gods and wanted to turn the world upside down. I believe that Nika and his ancient kingdoms of D-Carriers wanted to destroy the Red Line and create a united ocean. The 20 royal families wanted to prevent this so that the world would remain as it is. Creating a united ocean, that would turn the world upside down. Rosinante also mentioned that the D-Carriers would trigger a storm, the Flamingo was also afraid of this storm. Whether it is a metaphorical storm or a real storm is currently unclear. What is clear however is that the ancient kingdom fought against the 20 royal families and lost. I believe that at that time Nika was known as Joy Boy. He earned this nickname because of his nature, just like how Luffy is called Straw Hat. At some point Nika must have realized that he would lose. As a result, the Kozuki stonemasons created the 30 poneglyphs that were supposed to be scattered throughout the world. According to Imu, the world government eventually owned all the poneglyphs, however due to a mistake by Nefertari di Lili, the poneglyphs were scattered around the world. This was probably no mistake. There's long been a speculation that the poneglyphs were scattered around the world with the help of the Nikyo Nikyo no Mi. Perhaps Lili or one of her allies had this devil fruit. Nika was then captured at the end of the war. I can imagine that the showdown between Nika and his allies against the 20 royal families took place on the red line. This would also provide the perfect transition when our heroes start their war against the world government. But simply killing Nika would be too easy. What if Nika had to become a slave of the Tenryubitu in the end? Maybe even the first slave on Marijoa. Luffy's story would end with him being the person with the most freedom, whereas Nika's story might end with him being a slave. He was no longer Joy Boy, he was just Nika, the slave who would forever serve his enemies. But the Tenryubitu failed at one thing, they couldn't break Nika's will, just like they can't break Luffy's or Roger's will. As a result, Nika as a slave motivated the other slaves through his dancing and drumming. Among the slaves on Marijua, the legend of the sun god Nika spread. The dawn would someday come, the day they can wake up from this nightmare created by the world government, the Gorosei and Imu. I believe that at the end of the story, Nika lost all the freedoms he had in his life. Except one, he had his imagination. Just like Viktor Frankl. As the Gurusei rightly said, Nika's devil fruit has the greatest freedom because it is only limited by the imagination of its user. Nika's imagination was the last freedom he had, and his imagination was limitless. Although Nika probably had to die as a slave in the end, he still held on to his freedom somewhere in his mind. He knew he wouldn't die. Eventually, someone would find his treasure, ally with his former Nakama, and grant freedom to the world. Unfortunately, due to his illness, this someone was not Roger. But to Monkey Luffy, with the awakening of his devil fruit, will fulfill Nika's will and grant not only himself, but all the people in the world their freedom. The Tenryubitu will cease to exist and everyone will dance and be free. What is your opinion of this theory? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, why not watch this video next, where Ace is the main character in One Piece. Take care, see you in the next one.